Hello, and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we speak about the situation of the suffering and persecuted church around the world. Imagine sending your children to school and not being sure if they're going to come home at the end of the day. Imagine your neighbors terrorizing and attacking you, with you having little recourse to police or military intervention. This is the reality facing Catholics in northern Nigeria. Since 2015, an Islamic fundamentalist group called Boko Haram have been terrorizing and killing Catholics and Muslims in the northern part of Nigeria. To tell us more about the reality, it is my great privilege to welcome Father John Bakeni, the secretary of the Maiduguri Diocese in northern Nigeria and responsible for crisis intervention. Father John, thank you for being with us here today in our program. Thank you, Mark. It is my privilege and honor to be here with you. Father, uh, if, if we may, I'd like to create a little bit of a picture to understand where we are, what we're talking about when we're speaking about the northern part of uh, Nigeria, in particular, the Diocese of Maiduguri. Well, Maiduguri is the capital of Borno State and it's located in the northeastern part of Nigeria. As you know, Nigeria is a country of 36 states with a federal capital. And out of these 36 states, 19 states in the north are predominantly Muslim states, where Christians are a minority. And Borno state is one of the states. It became a state actually in 1976. And uh, it's, a, it's an old historical home, but for Islam. Actually, the Kanem Empire received Islam 800 years before the Sokoto Caliphate. And so it's the first place in Nigeria to receive Islam. And that is where Maiduguri Diocese is located uh, at. And it may interest you to know that uh, the, diocese, the Catholic Diocese of Maiduguri comprises of the whole of Yobe State, which is a nobody state, the whole of Borno State, and then part of Adamawa State. So it's, it's a huge diocese in terms of landmass. But the people themselves, the livelihood of the people would be agriculture or herding, what would, what would be their life? It's basically agriculture and then, of course, trade. You have also a good number that you work as civil servants in the government and then all that, but predominantly they are farmers. It's a very rural farming Very area. rural farming environment. How did Islam come into this part of Africa? Well, Islam, you know, came to the Kanem Empire, which is Borno Empire, as soon as it left the Arab Peninsula. So we're talking in the 7th century, 8th century? Yes, there about. But I think in Borno itself, I think it's around the late part of 10th century. And the relationship between Christians and Muslims uh, has never been easy in this part of the world. Where does this historical, not animosity, but tension, let's say, come from? Yeah, it would be good to know that the composition of, uh, of, of Borno state is predominantly a Muslim state, about 70%, if not more, Muslim, and about 25% Christian, and about 10% Catholic, you know. So we, we have about 300, I mean, 300,000 Catholics in the Catholic Diocese of Maiduguri, and which is Borno State. And historically, the Muslims and Christians have been living, so to say, in peace, fragile one, uh, and there have been challenges and difficulties that the Christians over time have learned to cope and live with. But this whole relationship became sour with the rise and coming of the Boko Haram insurgency. So the rise of the Boko Haram insurgency kind of affected the already fragile and delicate you know, relationship that existed before then, and uh, destroyed trust and set in suspic uh, suspicion, you know, and discord. 
But before the Boko Haram, which is, if you will, like almost like the tip of the arrow, uh, very, very acute, violent persecution, there had already been a history of, for example, forced marriages of girls and, and kidnapping. There had already, as you mentioned, this fragile relationship. How did Christians suffer persecution already before the time of Boko Haram? I think it is good to also look at that in the in the light of the wider context of Christians in northern Nigeria. And the history of discrimination and exclusion and even persecution are well documented in the history of Nigeria. Now, one of those clear manifestations is the denial of places, pieces of land to build places of worship. As far as my memory can take me back to the last time I think a certificate of occupancy was given for a building of a church was in 1979. You know, and then we are not allowed in most of the public schools in northern Nigeria to teach the Christian faith in our primary schools and secondary schools. Politically, Christians are being excluded. You know, and then they don't even have access to the resources of the state and sometimes in the area of employment, we are being discriminated upon. And even when you are employed, it is difficult for you to be promoted. And in our high institutions, sometimes some courses are reserved for the Muslim you know, youth. You know, you really have to work hard, for instance, for your child to read at medicine and some of these, you know, very privileged courses. And of course, worst of all is the forceful marriage abduction and sometimes kidnapping of our girls. And when we try to react, sometimes we are threatened and the next thing a church is set ablaze or some Christian is killed somewhere. So these are some of the challenges that we have been living with even before the rise of Boko Haram. For decades. For, for decades. For decades. Yes. So this is, just to understand, the reality of Christians in a day-to-day -day life living in Borno State. Yes, and more so in northern Nigeria. Boko Haram, what is it and how did it come to manifest itself, particularly in Borno State and all of the damage and the destruction that it has caused in your part of the world? Well, Boko Haram, uh, as the name suggests. What does the name mean? Boko in his Hausa language, Boko means education or learning, you know, and Haram, which is an Arabic word, but has the same meaning and nuance in the Hausa language, means forbidden. So you have halal, that which is accepted, and then you have haram, that which is forbidden. So, so the two names, Boko Haram, simply means Western education or Western culture is forbidden or prohibited. And uh, so it's, uh, some people try to place a historical timeline on the rise of Boko Haram. Some trace it back to 2002, some 2009, and then all that. But this ideology has been living on for so long, especially going back to the founder, Muhammad Yusuf, and listening to his homilies and sermons when he was alive and then all that. But it, it became very active and violent in 2009 when the Nigerian military destroyed their headquarters in Bayan quarters, which is located within the city of Meduguri. And so since then, they became very violent. And within the span of eight to nine years, we have seen that this terrorist group has grown in sophistication and in brutality. I think uh, most uh, other international community, or even as we experience them, they are the most brutal and callous you know, group of terrorists one can imagine in the world, worse than even ISIS. What makes them so brutal? I mean, what examples can you give us of, of this typical brutality that you live? Yeah, we have seen that clearly in the way they conducted their killings, you know, their killings and their destruction. I mean, in Islam, there are laws even for jihad, but we have, this group has violated almost every rule and law of jihad, like tearing women open, you know, slaughtering, you know, women and even invalids during war. You know, and, 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 and they are just messless, you know. So there are clear manifestations, destruction of lives, of property, and how they have destroyed, you know, people's uh, uh, homes, 
and businesses and even livelihood with no iota of mercy or even compassion. Was there one story that you encountered that struck you personally? Well, I, I have not come face to face with them, thank God, but I have lived in the situation and in an environment when some of these attacks were going on. And the house I presently live in, which is a cathedral, we had two bombs in 2011. Thank God, no, no priest was killed, but all the structures, you know, suffered damage. And unfortunately, there were some young, young school uh, kids who just closed from school and some passerbys that were caught up in that bomb outside and about 35 people were killed, you know. So, and then we had to leave almost for three, four years under the deafening sounds of gunshots and bomb explosions and rockets flying. And these things can go for hours. So for me, these are the experiences that, that remain very, very traumatic. And uh, one that really comes to mind clearly is when I had to go out to pick the corpse of uh, one of my members who was very close to the church. And I couldn't get the body because the whole city then was on fire. So it took me two days for me to recover the, the body of my member to bury, you know? And uh, there are so many stories, so many testimonies of people that I have to maybe document of people who are liberated, who are once in captivity and then all that. So but these are the experiences that really go through my mind and uh, they are terrible experiences. Father, a lot of people have fled and run yes. from Boko Haram. Where are they going and how many are we talking about? Yeah, if you follow the UN report, they will tell you over 5 million people have been displaced in Borno State. And when the Boko Haram terrorists, we saw how they took over one town after another. And when these people were displaced, everybody headed to the city of Medugri. And of course, when some came to Medugri, Medugri was congested, you know, overpopulated. Some of them had to move to the neighboring states, and some even further. But as it is today, within Medugri city, you have close to one million of these displaced persons who are living, as far as I know, in officially over 20 IDP camps. And then the majority of them actually live in neighborhoods with friends and relatives. And then some of them are scattered, you know, all over Nigeria, you know, so that was the reality. You mentioned earlier the fact that the Catholic Church had been attacked. In fact, the Catholic Church has become a particular target of Boko Haram. Why and how has this manifest itself? Yeah, I think it is coming clearly from the ideology of the terrorists and even from their proclamations and declarations. It's a declaration of war against infidels. And as Christians, most as Catholics, naturally, we, we were a target. You know, and uh, at the beginning, we saw how our members were being killed in their homes, in their places of business. And also we have few attacks in churches where people were killed during services. And uh, we have seen how our churches have been destroyed. As I speak to you now, you know, we, my Dubri Diocese lost over 200 churches, parish churches, including our session churches, we lost over 25 schools. We lost over 20 rectories. You know, we lost over four clinics, convents, and then all that. You know, and just to take you slightly back, uh, in 2016, you know, one of us was killed, you know, Reverend Father Michael Gajere. He was murdered in cold blood in his parish church. And we believe it was by the same, the same group. So we have become a target because of our presence in most of the place, most of the towns, and most of the villages, and, and, and all that. So, you know, these are some of the reasons why we are being targeted. What is the ambition of Boko Haram? What is it they want? Well, the ambition is to establish a caliphate. Like what happened, the idea in Iraq? Yes. And in the course of their campaign, some of the bigger towns that they, they captured you know, they made one. In fact, precisely, there is a local government that is called Goza. That became a caliphate for about six months. 
and then they persistently and consistently tried to take over the city of Meduguri so that they can have a bigger city and then establish that caliphate. And it's, their vision and dream is beyond Borno State. You know, it is actually an attempt to capture the entire country and then establish an Islamic caliphate. And that simply means that we are all going to live under Sharia law, you know, and, 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 and all that it, it entails. Where's the money coming from? They would not be able to do this without external international funding. Do we know where the money is coming from, where the weapons are coming from? Who's supporting this? I think the government knows where the money is coming from and where the weapons are coming from. But today, neither the international community nor the Nigerian government has told us, you know, who are the sponsors of this group. But we know that the nature of these terrorists, most of these guys are young, you know, and uh, they are poor. So where and how did they get money to buy AK-47 and all these rockets and, and then all that? Somebody or some group somewhere must be responsible. And so my take, to be honest with you, will be that we have some local Nigerian politicians who are behind this group, as well as some international funding agencies. And uh, I also believe that there are monies coming from the Gulf states. From the Arab states? Yeah. You mentioned poverty. How much does ignorance and illiteracy play a role in all of this? Well, it is, uh, that sounds very simplistic. And uh, it's, it's easy to blame this whole campaign and you know, the rise of Boko Haram on illiteracy and poverty. But I think there are basic questions we need to ask. You know, who has impoverished who in Borno State and in Northeastern Nigeria? Have their leaders been accountable with the subsidies they received from the federal government to improve the lives of their people? No. Have they opportunities and access to Western education? Yes, of course. But how many of them really avail themselves? You know? So it is very interesting to know that among the, the Boko Haram terrorist groups, there are many of them who speak English fluently, speak French fluently. Can an illiterate be able to make all these explosives? So it, is, it goes further than just mere illiteracy. I think it is an agenda. And just like any other conflict globally, it is the intention and the aim of the, of the sponsors, you know, to bring about this because of what they stand to gain out of it. We've been speaking a lot about the Christian community and the Catholic community as a victim, but many Muslims have also suffered at the hands of Boko Haram. Why are Muslims also victims of Boko Haram? Yes, uh, here, you know, one has to be careful with the danger of a single narration. And the whole thing about the rise of Boko Haram, initially the targets were Christians. But within these years again, Muslims have also fallen victims. And uh, I think the reason is simple, because they never bought into the ideology of these groups. And as I speak to you today, actually in the northeastern part of Nigeria, Muslims have suffered more loss of lives. They are the majority that are displaced. Churches and mosques are also being attacked. You know, means of livelihood of both Christians and Muslims are being attacked. So today, as it is, you know, as I said, it is not a single narration. You know, Christians and Muslims have become victims. And for good and moderate Muslims, and Christians, we have come to identify the Boko Haram terrorist group as our common enemy. And there's efforts also to isolate, uh, to identify, as you say, and isolate. But the challenge is, if I understand correctly, Boko Haram could be the brother sitting next to you. He could be the, the cousin. He could be the colleague. It's very difficult to identify who belongs to Boko Haram. Yeah. It, it may interest you to know that one of our saving graces was the rise of a local vigilante in Borno State. 
and it, you know it's called the Civilian Joint Tax Force. These are a group of young people in Borno State, especially in Medigree, who, when they got fed up, and though they saw and witnessed the callousness of this terrorist group, they decided to say, no, enough is enough. So this group rose up, and then they assisted the military in pushing the Boko Haram terrorist group out of the city of Medjugorje into the forest. You know? So there are concerted efforts you know, by, by the Muslims especially, and also by Christians you know, to, 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 to work jointly since we have identified a common enemy that we must work together to defeat this enemy. Have you been disappointed by the international community in the sense that one could say this is a genocide, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, first of all, that would be my first question. Yeah. Is it a genocide? And under what conditions does it fall under a genocide? That would be my first question. The second question would be, as a consequence, if it is a genocide, why is the international community so silent about this issue? I think, well, to call it a genocide may be uh, too specific, you know, for me, because a genocide will connote that a particular group is targeted for elimination. But as it is now, you know, almost everybody is, 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 is a... A victim. Yes, victim. So in a sense, yes. In a sense, no. But at least given the number of people that have been killed and then all that, one would expect that uh, the international community, you know, that have the means and the tools and the instrument, you know, to intervene in such situations would have acted, you know, uh, you, you know but uh, I am disappointed, you know, to some extent, you know. But again, I know also that uh, uh, so many countries are also working with the Nigerian government, especially our security, you know, to provide them with training and, you know, logistics and also, you know, to assist them in the, in the battle against them, you know. But uh, we will expect, as we see and watch in other places, you know, the intervention in, in, in some places, to see physical presence and intervention in order to stop this. But as, uh, you know, you know, as I said, I think they can do more. Priests, as you mentioned, a member of your, of your community and have been killed and sisters have been threatened and attacked, and yet they stay with the people. You stay with the people. Yeah. Why? I mean, <laughs> in many ways, you're the prime target. Uh, are you not afraid? And secondly, what is it that keeps you in your area? It is natural to be afraid, and uh, we had had moments when we were afraid, and uh, you know we we became hopeless. But I think there is something that keeps burning within us as priests and religious, by the virtue of our call. You know we are called to serve the people, and so whether in difficulties or in good times, and then all that. So when this uh, campaign of the Boko Haram insurgency became very intense and uh, we witnessed all the killings and the destruction and all that, you know, our people, some of them, of course, were displaced, but many of them, you know, remained. And we felt, you know, called and obliged to remain with them. It is our fate, you know, and uh, we know that uh, you know, at some point we were ready to even pay the supreme, you know, price. Because we know we are not the first, in fact, in the history of the church. And uh, we pray we'll be the last anyway, but, <laughs> you know, that, but it is our faith, you know, and our love for our people. But more importantly, too, the faith and the resilience that our people, our faithful, have also displayed. That in the midst of bombs going up, rockets flying, that never stopped them from coming to the church. And so we felt also strengthened and encouraged by their own faith. Father, how can we help? We know the situation and yet we're so far away and, and how can we help you? How can we help the situation in Northern Nigeria? Yeah, first of all, we ask and request for your prayers. Very, very important because we are a testimony you know, of your prayers and faith. In the darkest moments of our lives, we felt shielded 
covered and protected by the prayers of the faithful coming from all over the world. Secondly, given the discrimination we suffer from the government and lack of access to the resources and all that, we will need also funds in, you know, in order to build our lives again. You know, as I said, we have suffered so much destruction. And on this note, with every sense of gratitude, I want to thank the each the church in need. They have stood by us when all seem to have been lost. So not just praying for us, but they support us in the humanitarian services and interventions. You know, now we are in the recovery phase of the diocese. They are helping to rebuild some of our rectories, some of our churches. They support the training of seminarians. They support the annual you know, you know, retreat of the priests and also some empowerment programs for orphans and widows, you know. So if we can have more of this assistance, you know, we'll be able to build our lives. And uh, as it is, our faith has only been tested and purified. And that is the only gift and the grace we have to offer the Universal Church. And the hope remains. Yeah. <laughs> Always. The hope is ever strong. Always. Yes, always. Father John, thank you for having been with us today in our program. Thank you, Mark, for this uh, unique opportunity to share my story with you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today in our program, Where God Weeps. You've heard the stories from Father John and the situation of Catholics in northern Nigeria. And I would ask you to consider the contact information at the end of this program to think how you might be able to help. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.